Sonia Els. Sonia, Dr. Sonia Els. I hope I got that right, Sonia. And then we will have Joseph Keng. And lastly, we will have a video recording for those of us who are with us yesterday. You know, we had uh, Chantel Moyo from Zimbabwe who was trying to make a presentation, but because of technical difficulties, she couldn't make the presentation. So she has been gracious enough to send us the video, uh, audio recording of our presentation, which we will play just before we get to our question and answer session. Um, the rules of the game have not changed from yesterday. So all presenters have strictly 15 minutes to make their presentations. And on this one, I will be, I will not be a Kenyan, I'll be a German, making sure that we stop at exactly 15 minutes. So I hope that we will all try to make our presentation within that time uh, limitation so that we can have adequate uh, uh, time for question and answer. So without further ado, uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the first uh, speaker for today. Her name is Miss Petronel Kruger. And as I told you earlier, she's presenting on, uh, on her own behalf and uh, Miss Safura Abdul Karim. The title of their paper is uh, State Force in Compelled Public Health Interventions. And they're asking a question, is it all for one or one for all? and they will be sharing from the South African perspective. Petronil Kruger is a researcher at the South African Medical Research Council, Center for Health uh, Economics and Decision Science at the University of Bits. She is an admitted attorney of the High Court of, Z of South Africa, sorry. Uh, she holds an LLM in uh, Human Rights and Democratization from the University of Pretoria and she's currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Bates in the area of access to adequate housing. Uh, her counterpart, uh, Karim, they work together. And for Karim, she, uh, her area of focus is uh, mainly on prevention and control of non-communicable diseases, as well as using the law to improve health outcomes more broadly. Uh, she holds an LLM in global health law from the Georgetown University, and she's also uh, pursuing her uh, PhD. So without further ado, I now hand over to Petronil, and your 15 minutes starts right away. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Wendo. And on behalf of both myself and my co-author, just to thank everyone for this opportunity um, for presenting and being in such a esteemed uh, conversation and, and just I'm going to continue um, with the full faith that my presentation is in fact reflecting on the screen. So let's jump in immediately. So we're asking all for one and one for all in the context of compelled public health interventions, specifically looking at South Africa. And effectively, we're asking the question, does South Africa's use of compelled public health interventions accord with its international human rights obligations? Now, there might be some nomenclature here that we don't use in normal human rights um, discussion. So we'll be talking a little bit about what compelled public health interventions are and why we see it as state force. And the reason for this very particular question is because we think it gives us a segue to discuss some important issues. So expanding what we deem state force and how we evaluate our pandemics beyond just the normal media um, darlings of seeing excessive state force on the TV and commenting on that, but really expanding that conversation further. And also looking at the interplay between promoting public health objectives and pandemic responses as an actual fulfillment of the state's positive duty to promote access to health care against the tension with other individual rights that have to be limited um, as part of this public health response. And then finally, we're doing a case study of South Africa uh, because we think South Africa presents a, a unique um, vantage point to look at these compelled public health interventions. Firstly, it gives us an opportunity to apply what we call a human, human rights-based approach to public health interventions in a very concrete uh, situation to show that it is in fact practical and that it can also promote efficacy of public health responses. 
Secondly, because South Africa um, has created a parallel set of regulations on compiled public health interventions, which allows us to investigate what some of the, the deviations were from the so-called normal um, regime. And finally, because South Africa, despite its history of um, judicial and academic statements on the HIV and AIDS pandemics and tuber tuberculosis and how it should be human rights compliant and its fast and effective um, state response sees the lion's share of COVID infections on the continent. So just a quick note on what is a compelled public health intervention and why do we view it as a use of force? So when we talk about compelled public health intervention, we use the term public health intervention to describe testing, isolation, and quarantine. And we marry it to the principle of using state force because it contains the compulsion. Uh, so usually one would hope in a public health emergency, the majority of the populace would voluntarily comply with testing, isolation and quarantine standards. Unfortunately, that's just not the lived reality and states have to provide some sort of legal mechanism um, to compel non-compliant members of the public. And sometimes this will take the form of a court order and where court order is not being respected, it will move then away from a court order to an actual a physical coercion, such as a law enforcement officer um, restraining a person, forcing them to be tested, restraining them for 14 or 10 days in isol isolation or quarantine, or using the threat of imprisonment um, to inform compliance. So when we speak about compelled public health interventions, it already inherently um, targets or uh, invokes certain tensions within a, a human rights system where we see that being forced to undergo treatment or isolation or quarantine will limit a, a variety of rights. You know, the highlight package sort of being privacy, bodily and physical integrity, the right to health and the right to dignity. Um, However, what we want to contribute to this conversation is instead of viewing public health as this necessary evil and always incorporating it in human rights discussion as a, a necessary limitation on human rights, we want to highlight that a state's duty to effectively prevent, treat, and control epidemic diseases such as COVID is actually mandatory in terms of its uh, human rights obligations to promote access to healthcare. And we see this internationally, but also regionally in the African continent. So the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights not only uh, places this duty on states to prevent and treat uh, pandemic diseases, but it actually makes as a core obligation of uh, providing access to healthcare that states have to have a national public health strategy that's based on epidemiological evidence and that addresses the health concerns of the whole nation. Which means in short, state responses have to be evidence-based and effective. And then in the African Charter, while in the Charter itself, we don't see reference to pandemic response, we see that when we elaborate on access to healthcare in the region, that the guidelines and principles on economic, social, and cultural rights gives us more guidance as to what a human rights-based approach to pandemic responses will look like. And it shows us that it has to be coordinated, participatory, transparent, and accountable. It has to acknowledge the existing criminal and public health framework to make sure that it accords with other human rights norms. And it has to have accountability mechanisms built in and maximize community input. So in short, our discussion shouldn't be COVID versus human rights, but how we combat COVID with human rights. So we're moving away, ooh, I, okay, well, we're moving away from a situation where we um, view public health as a, a, a necessary counteract to the rights of the individual um, to a situation where we try and balance and respect 
both this injunction on states to protect the health of all individuals, but also to um, make sure that other rights are not sacrificed at the altar of the almighty public health limitation. So reviewing the principles from international and regional treaties, we see the following four elements. We see that it, a public health response has to be, or pandemic response has to be participatory, democratic, evidence-based and effective. It has to be subject to accountability mechanisms and it has to be minimally invasive of other rights. So let's apply this framework to uh, the South African um, regime. So as a point of departure, it's important to note just what the current situation is in compelled public health interventions. So we've spoken a lot about uh, almost all states using a state of disaster instead of a, a state of emergency, um, and therefore states using regulations outside of the normal regulatory framework um, to regulate compelled public health interventions and other interventions. So before COVID, we had a legal regime that dealt with compelled public health interventions. Um, and the two main differences between this regime and the COVID regime is that during the normal regime, um, we saw that to compel someone to undergo a public health intervention, a warrant had to be obtained from the high court, from a high ranking health administrator, usually the head of a department, um, a provincial health department. And this person has to convince the court that in, uh, along with a bunch of other factors that the specific patient was counseled as to the specific intervention and adequately explained what the intervention would entail as well as the consequences. In addition, our normal regime did not specifically create a penalty for failure to comply but we have seen that our common law has criminalized the transmission of uh, communicable diseases such as HIV and AIDS. Now, how COVID departs from this is uh, the, the warrant process looks different. Uh, firstly, a law enforcement officer, not a health official, will approach a magistrate court and really only has to uh, convince the magistrate that there is a reasonable suspicion that the person has either been exposed to or has contracted COVID. So we've waived this counseling and information sharing component. Secondly, our COVID regulations criminalize not just transmission, but also expands the common law offense to include exposure. Um, so it, criminalizing the exposure of COVID, which is very far reaching and creates a lot of uncertainty. So when we apply those principles of what a human rights based approach to um, a pandemic response should be, we can see a few uh, important takeaways from the South African situation. Firstly, this issue of ad hoc regulating the COVID-19 response creates problems with a variety or for a variety of reasons. It limits the ability of the public to participate in lawmaking, which would happen if a normal parliamentary process was followed, i.e. the pandemic response was pre-prepared. Secondly, it means that some of the provisions were created in haste and we see that there's no specific accountability mechanisms built in and that the plan isn't necessarily based on evidence and uh, past experiences with HIV and AIDS. Uh, also the process of the compulsion means that we have removed this element of information sharing and counseling. Um, the idea being perhaps that this will hasten the process and make it more effective. However, the nature of this process to obtain a warrant is cost effective and very timely. And this judicial oversight really is um, an artificial sense of accountability as it functions as a rubber stamping. Uh, so we say remove that fake judicial oversight and rather place the decision-making power with a health worker, but reincorporating this principle of counseling and information sharing. 
And because the ship is being built as we sail it, it's difficult to determine what evidence to consider and what evidence um, you know, will still be developing. However, we've seen that there's a disjuncture with how courts have evaluated uh, evidence placed before it. Um, so, for example, in the, the beer case where the court expected concrete evidence, while in FITA where, you know, there was this acknowledgement that we're not exactly sure what the best port of call is. However, we have previous case law that clearly states that our responses in public health emergencies have to be evidence-based, and we should follow that. And then finally, in terms of ensuring that our public health response is minimally invasive, uh, we need to limit, uh, we need to remove criminalization and limit recourse to compelled quarantine and isolation. We've seen compelled quarantine and isolation and criminalization promoting and creating stigma around the disease and that undermines efforts to test. Um, and it also has an inequitable impact on the poor, who because of their, their housing situation and because of economic insecurity are incentivized to not necessarily comply with quarantine and uh, isolation requirements as they might have to you know, work day by day or not have access to food and sanitation if they're required to stay in their informal housing. So using the South African experience, we've sort of distilled a few transferable lessons that we think can be applied broadly. Uh, firstly, we say that pandemic responses should be pre-prepared. Uh, there was a lot of discussion yesterday on how states couldn't have foreseen a pandemic of this nature. But the fact of the matter is, um, even the ICESCR recognize that you know, pandemics occur from time to time and there has to be adequate preparation. And there's no reason for this to happen on an ad hoc basis when the, the crisis actually manifests. And states should prioritize information sharing and consultation with its populace. Several studies have shown that the more informed the community and the populace, the more likely they are to voluntarily comply with all public health measures. And this expands beyond um, compiled public health interventions to things such as lockdowns as well. And states need to observe accountability and avoid incorporating mechanisms in their state response that would, for example, give immunity to law enforcement officials for bona fide mistakes. And finally, we need to relook at how we compel people to undergo these interventions. We need to remove criminal penalties completely as it only contributes to stigma and it is applied inequitably. And we need to use compelled isolation and quarantine and state facilities truly as a last resort, as it is seen as concomitant punishment, but also just compelling isolation and quarantine should be viewed as a matter of last resort. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Petronil. You've been bang on on time and uh, you've shared with us a uh, very important uh, uh, things uh, in, in your presentation on how we can then deal with uh, public health interventions, especially where this is compelled. Uh, some of the things that we need to observe and you pointed out that the four things that you pointed out are very critical participation and, and democratic uh, values being inculcated in the process. The whole question of accountability, uh, effective and evidence best as well as minimally invasive uh, approach. So thank you so very much. I am sure that from your presentation, there are a number of issues that uh, those who are participating may want to bring uh, uh, to the table for discussion. So at this juncture, allow me now to introduce our second uh, presenter. <clears throat> Her name is uh, Dr. Sanya Els. She will be presenting on the enforcement of COVID-19 lockdown regulations, a critique on the role of the South African National Defense Force. Uh, Dr. Els is a senior lecturer at the Department of uh, Mercantile and Public Law, Faculty of Military Science, University of Stellenbosch, South Africa, and teaches contract law, applied commercial law, military law, uh, law of armed conflict. She is also an admitted advocate of the High Court of South Africa and a member of Defense Legal Services Division 
for more than 20 years. Her major research areas uh, cover international law, uh, specifically human rights, uh, human rights law and law of armed conflict, military law, including oper uh, operational law, uh, law of evidence, criminal procedure, and cyber law. So over to you, Dr. Els. You also have 15 minutes. Good morning from a Chile Saldana Bay in the Western Cape, and thank you for the opportunity to share my paper with you. The aim of my article is to critically assess the role of the SANDF during the enforcement of the lockdown regulations. Now, following the declaration of the state of national disaster, President Ramaphosa ordered the internal deployment of the SANDF to support the police in the enforcement of the lockdown regulations. This joint deployment, referred to as Operation Not Clela, meaning lock in Sesotho, escalated to 73,180 soldiers, being the biggest ever internal deployment of the SANDF. The Disaster Management Act authorizes the release of any available resources of the national government, including that of personnel, for the rendering of emergency services. Thus, the SANDF as an organ of the state could be utilized. Now, from the onset, there were numerous concerns on the dynamics of civil military relations, which demand sufficient safeguards to protect human rights of civilians. Issues raised included the legality of such deployment and also the possibility of non-compliance with good governance and the rule of law. Without engaging the legality of any of the lockdown regulations, my article seeks to investigate mainly two critical issues. Firstly, it interrogates the existence of a mission-specific legal framework which obliges the SANDF to respect human rights. And then secondly, it analyzes and evaluates the conduct of soldiers to determine the extent to which human rights were indeed complied with during this deployment. During the lockdown, it became evident that there exists a large measure of distrust between the civilians and the SANDF. It was especially during the COSA case that deficiencies in terms of adherence to the rule of law were identified. In this case, the court referred to the social contract between the state and the populace and the effect that this relationship ultimately has on the existence or not of mutual respect for the rule of law. The court said this contract is defined by the constitutional values of human dignity, equality, freedom, accountability, openness, as well as the advancement of, of human rights. I use this notion to determine whether the government and the SANDF ultimately fulfilled their constitutional obligations in terms of this social contract. Before I address the first issue of the legal framework, I want to touch on good governance as it encompasses the study and provides the tool for the application. Now, good governance has three functions in the relationship with human rights. In that, firstly, it serves as prerequisite for aid and assistance. Secondly, guides the execution of human rights. And thirdly, serves as a preventative mechanism for the violation of human rights. Thus, my argument is that if principles of good governance are met, violations of human rights may be avoided and the rule of law will prevail. The first consideration of my paper is the application of human rights law. Sonia, I can't hear you. Did we lose Sonia? Did we lose Sonia? It looks like we did. We might just advise her to switch I off like... her video. Uh, sorry. Hello, Sonia. We hello, lost hello. Please proceed. Okay, can you hear me again? Now we can. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you. I was referring to the two international treaties that find application, the ICCPR and the United Nations Torture Convention. Now, Article 4, Subsection 4 of the Torture Convention specifies that no exceptional circumstances, including any state of emergency, may be invoked as justification of torture. And this convention was ratified by South Africa and also domesticated through the Prevention of Combating and Torture of Persons Act. 
So then after this, turning to domestic law, I considered sections 36 and 37 of the constitution and the difference between the limitation of rights approach in section 36 and the derogation from rights approach in section 37. Now this was also covered by speakers, many speakers yesterday. Um, as Professor Mubiza pointed out yesterday, similar to Malawi, the South African position during the lockdown was not that of a state of emergency, but a state of nat national dis disaster. And therefore, any human rights violation must be tested against the proportionality test of Section 30 36. In the enforcement of lockdown regulations, the question will be whether the state could have introduced less restrictive means to achieve the purpose of the regulation. And then the court in the, high, uh, in the COSA case confirmed that the least restrictive measures must not only be sought, but must be applied and communicated to the people. If section 37 was applicable uh, during a state of emergency, rights would have been suspended, coupled to parliamentary oversight. Um, however, even then certain rights, such as the right to human dignity would still have been non-derogable. It is therefore evident that international and national human rights law clearly demand respect for human rights from members of the SANDF. The next step will then be to evaluate the mission specific legal mandate for Operation Hotlela. And this will be determined mainly by the constitution as well as the Defense Act. Um, I looked at the constitution in a nutshell, the following sections according me, to me were relevant. Section 200, subsection two, that establishes the primary object of the, the SNDF as to defend and protect the Republic, the territorial integrity and the people. And I argued that the word defend would imply defense against a military threat. And the word protect would then include protection from natural disasters, um, yeah, be it as it may. Then also section 201 subsection 2 stipulates three, stipulates three instances where the SNDF may be deployed and uh, coupled to that section 201 subsections 3 and 4 constitutes further imperative procedural requirements for the president to inform parliament of the reasons of the deployment, the number of people involved, etc. Then ultimately section 199 subsection five places a continuous obligation on security services to act, teach and require their members to act in accordance with the constitution and the law. This is important because for Operation Atlela, it will imply that soldiers and policemen for that matter must receive training on when and how fundamental rights of citizens may be limited during the enforcement of the lockdown regulations. Looking at the Defense Act, the sections that find applic application was section 18, subsection 1, section 19.3c, section 20, and specifically section 20, subsection 11. Now, section 18.1 mandates internal deployment for four purposes. First of all, preservation of life, health or property in emergency or humanitarian relief operations. Secondly, provision of essential services. Thirdly, provision of support to any department of state and lastly effecting of national border control. Section 193C determines that the deployment must be performed in accordance with the code of conduct and operational procedures. And take note of the word must here. Yeah. Section 20 referred to various acts such as the Police Act and the Criminal Procedure Act affording soldiers similar competen competencies of obligations and liabilities as those of policemen or traffic officers, including law enforcement powers. And section 2011 determines that soldiers must receive appropriate training prior to such deploy uh, deployment and must be equipped properly. Now, looking at section 193C and section 2011, it's clear that the legislator intended to provide certain checks and balances to safeguard against abuse of power. And this was a, an important aspect in the COSA judgment. The statutory requirement of training was also discussed in a recent webinar held by the Institute of Security Studies. One scholar there argued the military and the police have been coordinated since mid-1990. No police powers were previously granted to the military. 
And during the same webinar, another scholar, a former SNDF army colonel, disclosed that ongoing training of soldiers does include crowd control courses. And furthermore, that the extensive exposure to peacekeeping missions We seem to be losing Sonia again. Sonia, can you hear me? Sonia. Hello, Sonia, can you hear me? Yes, I'm very sorry about this. The Western Cape internet. Can, can okay. you still hear me? Can I proceed? Yes, you can proceed now because of the your your internet challenges. Probably you just now run through very fast, so that we are able at least to get a, a bit of what you you like to present, just in case it fails you again. Yes, yes, I will proceed to do so. Um, right. So, so um, President Ramaphosa mandated the, the, the um, deployment in terms of Section 18.1 of the Defence Act, and he didn't refer to Section 19. So it was thus controversial whether the requirements of a code of conduct and operational procedures then indeed applied to Operation Notlela. And these requirements are central to the inquiry of my paper as it needed to delineate the basic assumption of the threshold concerning acceptable military conduct in limitation of fundamental rights while enforcement while enforcing lockdown regulation. My analysis reveals that the SNDF conducted Operation Notlela without any mission-specific code of conduct or operational procedures. In the COSA case, the SNDF claimed that the requirements in terms of Section 19.3c was not mandatory, as the mandate to deploy was given through Section 18 and not Section 19. However, the, court, the COSA court ruled that Section 19 was directly applicable. The interpretation of the court's ruling is that Section 18 then constitutes the general provision for all internal deployments, and that Section 19 does not replace Section 18 or 20, but specifies the preconditions for employment in consideration with the police. Um, the court ruled that the content of a document that was presented by the SNDF, the SNDF on the one hand says that the, um, Section 19 didn't apply to them. On the other hand, it was argued that the requirements, um, were, that the procedures were indeed in place and that there was a joint operations directive that was given to Charlie Company of 21 Psi Battalion. Apparently that was the battalion that operates in the township of Alexandra where Mr. Koza was residing. But the court then ruled that the content of this document was insufficient for purposes of section 193C and that in order to comply with the rule of law, clearer and louder commands and warnings must be provided um, to soldiers. And the court then ultimately confirmed the legal mandate for Operation Notlela and ordered the SNDF to then, um, within five days, develop and publish the Code of Conduct, etc. So the second crucial issue of my article was to analyze and evaluate the, the specific conduct of soldiers to determine the extent to which human rights were indeed complied with during this deployment. Many video clips displayed on social media and television news portrayed images of soldiers and policemen using excessive force. Examples included reports of water cannons, rubber, rubber bullets used, um, soldiers pouring water and liquor over the heads and bodies of civilians, demanding civilians to roll in mud and do push-ups and ju jumping squats, etc. None of these allegations were tested in a criminal court yet and may in future prove to be either the truth or the result of fake news. Then there's the specific incident of, of Mr. Colin Scorza, who was allegedly tortured and killed by soldiers at his house in Alexandra, um, was widely reported. And then relatives of him then approached. He died, um, according to the Cosa court and the affidavits in their possession, and um, he died subsequently as a result of a blunt force injury to the head. 
um, relatives, relatives of him then approached the High Court seeking various declaratory orders, such as an order to confirm the existence of human rights under the lockdown, and also to order the members of the SNDF to then act in accordance with the constitution and with minimum force. Um, the course of case contextualized the aspects of human rights and the role of security forces in the lockdown enforcement without touching on the merits of the case, as the criminal investigation is still subjudicated. And concerning the rule of law and human rights obligations by the SNDF, the COSA court assessed mainly three notions. First of all, the, the training of soldiers, the operational guidelines, which I've already discussed. Secondly, the image and the reputation of the SNDF. And lastly, then the measures of complaint handling. Looking at the image and the reputation, um, my argument is that a high level of trust between the government and the populace will ensure the legitimacy and the success of the social contract referred to in the COSA case. Now, if it's evident that through all the negative media reports, the image and reputation of the SANDF was seriously impaired. And in the COSA case, um, the judge specifically um, criticized the leadership of the SANDF, both military as well as political, in this regard. And he referred to numerous public comments made by the Minister of Defence and military veterans, for instance, saying it will only be skop, skit and donder, meaning kick, shoot and beat, um, when circum circumstances determine that. Um, and she said, for now, we are a constitutional democracy, implying that if provoked, constitutional rights may be impaired. And then also um, the judge referred to the measures of complaint handling, where all their complaints were lodged at the office of the military ombud. Um, currently, the only complaint mechanism against SANDF members, apart from criminal investigations, and eventually the court ruled that this forum is in inadequate as it lacks institutional impartiality and sufficient human resource capacity. So my conclusion is that clear evidence displays this disproportionate force used by the military on various occasions. Unfortunately, the state has failed to respect the legal obligations towards the populace, especially in the context of human rights. Analysis of the COSA case shows that the failure was the result of poor leadership, poorly trained soldiers, and unclear rules of engagement. Various recommendations were made. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to consider that here. But despite all the negative interventions, it's undisputed that Operation Notlela also contributes to exacerbate the fight against COVID-19. Apart from law enforcement duties, soldiers also assisted with various humanitarian relief actions, including medical screening and establishment of field hospitals. To end with the philosophy of Ubuntu with its emphasis on compassion, solidarity and respect for humanity is a golden thread in the South African constitution. The SANDF mission commander of the Eastern Cape, Brigadier General Matanda, publicly commented that there is plenty room for members of the SANDF to show Ubuntu during the COVID-19 deployment. Sorry, Sonia. Sorry, Sonia. My, my last yes. sentence. Can I just finish? Thank you. Please, um, please conclude now. Yes, and then Matanda pronounces that his personal message to his subordinates is to be disciplined and to remember that those people um, that are dealing with are their mothers, their fathers, their brothers and their sisters. So ultimately, um, I'm pleading for Ubuntu um, in, in the reinstating of the social contract. Thank you, Mr. All right. Thank you very much, Sonia. I grant you, uh, I decide to operate within the Ubuntu spirit, granting you uh, graciously some few minutes. I thank you so much. The challenges that you faced. Thank, uh, but thank you. Thank you for, for, for that interesting uh, um, presentation in which you raise a number of things. Um, just uh, to highlight a few of them, you, you, you talk about the legal basis for the deployment of soldiers you have mentioned, uh, uh, you've, you've talked about the conduct of these officers and, and the adherence to, to the rule of law, to the human rights standards while they are going through their duties, especially in, in uh, countering this uh, pandemic. And you also raise an issue on the accountability mechanisms in, in how they do, uh, they, they have gone about their duties. So without uh, further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now allow me to introduce our third speaker for this morning. And his name is Mr. Joseph Geng Akech.
who will be, um, the title of his presentation is Winning to Lose, Implications of South Sudan's COVID-19 Response on Social Economic uh, Rights of Women and Children. Uh, just to give you some info on uh, who Joseph Aketch is, he is a passionate human rights lawyer and a constitutional law researcher. His research interests are in constitution making, transitional justice, peace building, and children's rights. Joseph is a doctoral candidate at the University of Pretoria with over 10 years of professional career working with international organizations on issues of governance, uh, child rights, and human rights advocacy. Currently, he serves as the director of advocacy campaigns and safeguarding at the Safe Children International South Sudan Country Office. Now over to you, Joseph, and you have 15 minutes. Joseph, please proceed. Um, sorry, I am trying to figure out where I can share. Um, just one second. Uh, We, we can see what uh, what is on the screen. So please just proceed so that we can save on time. You can just All run. Right, right. So yeah. if you can see that, that's fine. Um, yeah. uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my presentation focuses on uh, the implications of South Sudan uh, COVID-19 response uh, on children and women's social economic rights. Um, in terms of the outline, um, I will start by giving you a country context with the view of placing this um, um, presentation within relevant um, uh, context that informed the measures that were adopted. And then I'll transition to talk about the uh, win to lose, which is very central to uh, my, my paper. And then I'll demonstrate some evidence on the implications uh, of COVID-19 measures that were adopted on children and women in particular. And then I will close um, with some lessons for the future. So in terms of, um, in terms of the country context, um, it, it, it must be needless to say that South Sudan is, is, is among the um, one of the newest country uh, that has been unfortunately um, ravaged by self-inflicted conflict that has claimed several lives and, and has therefore impacted on uh, the extent to which democracy uh, was, was, was functioning. Um, and uh, to end the conflict, an agreement was signed between different factions and that agreement established a very huge government uh, unprecedented, in fact, of uh, a, pres uh, you know, a president and, and five vice presidents, um, more than 600 legislators, and a similar um, government in the states. Um, what is important in this agreement is that it brings together uh, parties that were opposed to each other and were fighting. And so that makes the decision-making processes quite difficult in both the executive and parliament. Um, the, the country does not have a permanent constitution, so it uses the transitional constitution that was adopted from uh, the interim constitution of 2005 uh, that was immediately adopted after the, uh, the comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, this is, in fact, my PhD focus, but the idea here is that the peace agreement uh, provides for mechanism for making a permanent constitution. So what is being used as a constitution now is the peace agreement itself and some bits of the transitional constitution that, that then existed. So that adds to the layer of complexities in, in how democratic institutions are supposed to function. Uh, on top of this, South Sudan um, you know, is faced by several challenges. It, it is rich in oil resources, but uh, it is one of the poorest countries, um, very unfortunate, uh, with very poor health infrastructure, um, low uh, human development, um, as well as the, you know, the number of refugees and IDPs that have been displaced because of war. So that all adds up to the choices that were available to the government in, in coming up with decisions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, and with that comes the, the number of uh, 
international actors that are present in the country and which have uh, in, you know, conflicting advice um, to the decision-making processes. Uh, the numbers show that uh, we are among the least in, in, in the region, uh, but that is the poll's uh, picture, which I will then now describe how that uh, you know, creates a, a dynamic of win to lose. Uh, the images that were adopted by the government of South Sudan uh, were adopted under a general powers granted uh, to the president, um, but he did not declare a state of emergency. Instead, he declared a public health uh, caution, uh, which then securitized the way in which COVID-19 was, was managed. Um, so a very huge presence of national security in the very early days of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, enforcing curfew, as well as the contact tracing of, of patients. But later on, uh, these, these uh, measures were rolled back and everything functioned pretty much the same as if there was no COVID-19. Um, but the declaration itself uh, ought to have been presented just like other countries' uh, constitution require, should have been presented to the national legislature to discuss after 15 days, um, after 14 days of, of uh, the order, so that there is an oversight from the legislators to um, you know, get to understand why the, the measures were to be extended. The measures also uh, should have been implemented together with the social protection policies that would have then provided um, additional protective measures uh, to the poor uh, whose businesses and livelihoods were impacted. So instead, uh, what the president did was that the order was not tabled before the floor of parliament. Uh, and the idea was that uh, the parliament has not been reconstituted as required by the peace agreement to bring in other parties, uh, MPs. Um, and, and secondly, that they were acting uh, fast enough to save lives. Uh, our constitution also enjoins a court and human rights commission to investigate and monitor human rights violations. Uh, during the early days of COVID-19, several abuses were reported, but the human rights commission and the court did not intervene. Uh, and that explains the, the level of you know, rule of law and good governance in the country where everything is, is not functioning effectively. Uh, the social protection measures were not consulted, and so um, the, the women businesses, uh, which were closed down in the early days, uh, were affected. And some of these women, in fact, most of these women operate informal businesses on which they depend on, and so that created an impact on their livelihoods. Um, one of the measures was that the closure of schools, and so children still remain at home, that has resulted in surge of domestic violence at home. So I argue that this has created, if you like, um, a win for prevention of a, what would be the community transmission that would have been uncontrollable given the full state of public health in South Sudan. So at least one can say that even if the numbers are not representative of, of the true picture because the testing capacity is limited, they have been able to control uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19 in the community. So, so that can be seen as a win, but at a cost where you know, women uh, livelihoods and children's rights education have been affected. And I started earlier on with the context. So South Sudan um, you know, is born at the backdrop of a long-standing conflict with the Sudan. Now losing a generation to education because of COVID-19 could actually add to the complexities that prevent this country from taking off to um, achieve democratic ideals. Um, so, so what is this uh, win-lose? Um, as I had started by saying that South Sudan successfully somehow managed to prevent uh, community transmission. You know, NGOs have warned that South Sudan's uh, public health system is, is fragile and would not cope with the community transmission. And so somehow um, the measures that were adopted sort of prevented that, that, uh, that um, uh, from happening, that community transmission from happening. Uh, there has not been uh, a social protection uh, policies that were adopted to provide for uh, support to the families that have lost income. Neither was there some cash payments to, to uh, children who used to get some of this uh, money from, uh, from school, a project called Girls Education uh, uh, Project, Girls Education Service. So 
children who could not go to school are unable to, to earn a living, and that has resulted to increased number of children on the streets, as well as women's informal businesses impacted generally. Um, and, and so I argue that this has created a contradiction in which the government could claim that they have prevented uh, the, the spread of COVID-19 in the communities, uh, but in the end, we would see a generation loss uh, because of the closure of the schools, um, adding to the 2 million, 2.2 million children that are already out of school. But it could also send most of the families already living under poverty line, uh, you know, deep into the poverty, um, you know, po poverty py pyramid. Uh, and I also argue that uh, women in particular were already marginalized and, and have been struggling to cope with COVID-19 in, in the house um, without engaging in businesses. Uh, and that represents uh, a, you know, a decline in, in the fight against inequalities, uh, as well as the fight against um, illiteracy in, in, in South Sudan. So, so the evidence on the implications of measures that were adopted um, is uh, firstly that um, on, on the right to education, uh, all children are not going to school because schools are, are closed. Um, and there are reports, service children held um, a consultative uh, meeting with children. Children have reported um, a surge in violence at home, um, increased pregnancies uh, among girls, um, but more importantly, most children are going on the streets because they have lost income. Uh, you know, families have lost, 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 lost income and they are unable to earn a living um, and, and get something to eat. Um, but this has actually negated the strides that were made to send, uh, you know, to get 2.2 million children back to, to school. Um, on top of uh, the fact that illiteracy stands at a very high rate. And in terms of women's loss of income, um, women, as I said before, are among the marginalized and have been affected by the closure of businesses. Although now uh, the measures that were adopted are rolled back, so everything is functioning as before. However, the initial closure has affected the operations of businesses because what they did was that businesses that were not able to implement um, uh, you know, sanitization processes as well as uh, wearing of masks were, were unable to operate because um, you know, that represents a risk. Whereas the businesses operated by rich people, supermarkets and all that were, were allowed. So that created the imbalance and, and the loss of income by women especially those running informal businesses um, was impacted. And uh, as I said, argue later on, um, there was no support to, to restart their businesses or, or to recover from, from the loss that, that they have, they have uh, experienced. So what lessons can we hear and we learn from this? Um, firstly, I, I argue that um, in a country like South Sudan, uh, ravaged by conflict, um, when, when you contrast the priorities between, you know, fighting a pandemic that has been feared, um, uh, plus the, the implications of rule of law and consolidation of, of peace building, it, it tends to me that um, the peace building uh, takes precedence because that is what we have seen the government doing, that actually we would like to ensure that, um, you know, we focus on, on the peace agreement that we've signed um, as well as ensure that we prevent the community transmission that we will not be able to control given the state of public health um, in South Sudan. And, and, and because of the pre-existing trust deficits between the parties to the, to the peace agreement that have formed the government, decision-making processes was made difficult. Um, and, and so for, for countries that are in conflict, they, they, there's another layer um, that, that we can see when it comes to managing uh, pandemics. Um, they, they tend to already lack the trust and confidence they have to work together. And so decision-making um, becomes difficult. There's no consultation to institutions that are supposed to be part of, uh, of that decision. And that impacts on the rule of law. And for South Sudan, it's, it's, it's a great risk for consolidation of peace and constitutionalism.
Uh, needless to say that um, you know, if you if you talk about rule of law, you cannot leave um, the issue of social social protection because um, institutions would function, um, you know, when 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 the people trust that they can deliver services. Education and social welfare have been neglected here in terms of the budget allocation by the government, and so I recommend that um, the government strengthen social welfare sector uh, to protect the less fortunate, especially. Um, increase public investment in education and livelihoods. And this could mean collaborating with, with NGOs and UN agencies. And in terms of the disaster risk management, the policies were not used um, in as much as the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs exists with policies. Um, our disaster risk management is, is limited. Um, so the isolation uh, facilities and information sharing among children and women on COVID-19 was limited as well because um, disaster risk management and preparedness capacities are limited. And so this um, would need to be contemplated. And more importantly, contextualize how it's to respond 12 to um, you know, pandemics like this, because South Sudan, um, like other countries, just copied what was going on um, and did not contextualize, did not look into what needs to be done. Although um, they headed to the warning that uh, a total lockdown would not be bearable among the South Sudanese, um, because the government would, would need to provide the services to these, to these families. Um, I also think that rule of law and peace building are catalysts for a well-managed pandemic because um, a country that is in war is unlikely to manage a pandemic effectively. And this is what we have seen in South Sudan, that decision-making uh, was not possible because of trust deficit among the parties but also that conflict took precedent over um, consolidation of peace building. And that's why the president would not table the presidential order on COVID-19 before the floor of parliament to discuss. Um, and I think that the, the opportunity for a new constitution making process allows for a reflection on you know, the South Sudan institutions um, that, that we should build uh, for the future response and management of, of, of pandemics, but more importantly, the lessons that we need to learn from other countries in how they you know, make sure that the emergency powers and collaborative participatory decision-making process among institutions is um, guaranteed within the constitution. So that presents, in my view, an opportunity to, to reflect the learning into our uh, constitution making process and ensure that we, we learn from other countries. So I will, I will leave it there and I will interact with um, uh, further questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for that presentation. And I must uh, commend you for sticking to uh, the time limitations and making sure you present within the time that was allocated to you. Uh, you raise very important uh, issues, especially um, when it comes to uh, how weak uh, states can deal with this pandemic, uh, where we have a weak uh, human rights and uh, rule of law infrastructure, then you have such a pandemic striking, what does that mean for the society? You, may, you uh, allude to the vulnerability of women and children and how this affects them. And, and the whole future of a state, a new state like South Sudan, just what this pandemic uh, portends for them moving forward. Um, you also raise a number of issues on, uh, well, what I find uh, contradictory is uh, where you say that uh, the measures that have been put in place seem to be effective uh, in terms of controlling community infections, but then you have a huge number of people flooding the streets so that in, in, in my interpretation then just means that it is a disaster in waiting if it hasn't struck just yet. And therefore I question the effectiveness of the mechanisms that are put in place uh, moving forward. So at this juncture, uh, ladies, I wish to um, encourage you to send your questions, your comments that can be considered by the panelists which uh, we will commence uh, immediately after listening to the audio presentation that was sent in by Chantelle Moyo, who was uh, enlisted to present yesterday, but she couldn't.
So we now move on to the video, uh, to the audio presentation, and then after we go to the question and answer. But please send in your questions and, and your comments for consideration. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chantal Gloria Moyo. Um, I was supposed to present yesterday, but I encountered some technical difficulties that made it impossible for me to finish my presentation. So as such, I'm going to give this uh, presentation today. Uh, for those that were um, present yesterday, please bear with me because I'll have to start my presentation from scratch. The topic that I'm going to be presenting on this morning is urban spatial inequality and access to water in South Africa in the wake of and beyond COVID-19. Now this paper differs significantly from the other papers that have been presented so far, because in as much as those papers have focused on the extent to which the state will go to curtail human rights um, in an effort to contain um, the COVID-19 pandemic, my paper will focus on access to water in South Africa, and it will interrogate the adequacy of the state's response in the provision of access to water in South African townships in an effort to curtail the spread of um, COVID-19. Now, in as much as the paper is a bit, uh, it gives an in-depth analysis of spatial inequalities as it exists in South Africa and water access to water rights, uh, because these are not new phenomena, these are long-standing issues. Um, this presentation is going to give a brief overview of the pertinent issues as they relate to COVID-19 um, because of the time limitations that um, obviously we've been given to make this presentation. Now, spatial inequality is a result of in income inequalities between households. Um, now, these are expounded by factors such as initial conditions, history, institutions, endowments, trade, and etc. Uh, an example of this in the South African context, you would consider the development of cities such as Durban and Cape Town, which um, whose development can be attributed to these cities being trading ports and development of cities such as Johannesburg, Pretoria, being based on um, um, their mineral endowments. Now, in a similar fashion, the lack of development has historic origins, especially in townships. Um, due to the history of legacy, the sorry, the legacy of um, apartheid, which um, um, ensured that townships had minimal funding for infra infrastructural development, especially in the provision of basic services such as water. Uh, now, like I said before, access to water challenges are not a new issue in South Africa, but they are a long-standing issue. You have examples of um, townships such as Guguletu in Cape Town, townships such as Alexandra in Johannesburg, uh, which use communal taps in a constitutional democracy such as South Africa. And this, especially the water sector in South Africa is synonymous with protests where you have um, members of uh, various communities taking to the streets because their taps have run dry for two weeks, for a month, for over two months. Now, amid these challenges and um, in the paper itself, um, there's a section that talks about water quality and quantity in South Africa. And in the paper, I state that I would be amiss to talk about water quality and quantity in South Africa without mentioning the day zero um, uh, uh, occurrence in Cape Town, where the, the, the available water in South Africa was not enough in 2018 to 2019 to service most, base, uh, to service, uh, most South African cities. Now, in a country that already is water scarce, enters an unrelenting enemy that requires the very thing that is lacking in the country to curtail its spread, and that's COVID-19. Now, in as much as there are other measures to minimize the spread of COVID-19, this paper dwells and zeroes in specifically on the one that is reco um, recommended by, by the World Health Organization, which is the washing of hands under running water with soap for at least 20 seconds. Now, 
how does the state in South Africa ensure that in a country where most townships don't have enough access to water on a normal day, how do they ensure that they provide water to such townships during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Now, the paper uh, gives a background on the on the legislation actually that guarantees the rights to water to everybody in South Africa, regardless of where you stay, regardless of whether you're rich or you're poor, you earn a certain amount of money or you don't, the constitution guarantees water access rights to everyone. And you also have subsidiary legislation such as the, the National Water Act and the Water Services Act that further constitutional imperatives in providing the right to water to every citizen of South Africa. Now, in ensuring that people have access to water, the government, the state has responded by putting in place certain regulations that I unpack in the paper to assess whether or not these regulations actually further this right to water, that is a, a right of um, great importance amid uh, the COVID-19 because it is an issue of whether or not the spread of COVID-19 is successfully curtailed in townships or the, 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 the measures that the government has put in place fail outright in, in trying to curtail um, the spread of COVID-19. Now, the first regulation um, that uh, I'm going to talk about for the purposes of this particular presentation um, were the regulations that were put in place on the 15th of March uh, 2020 by the Department of Cooperative Gov Governance and Traditional Affairs. Uh, the name of the regulations are the Disaster Management Act 57 of 2002, Classification of a National Disaster, number 43096, stroke, stroke uh, 312. Now, this particular regulations, uh, the head of National Disaster Management Center classified COVID as a national disaster and called upon all organs to strengthen and support existing structures to implement contingency arrangements and to put in place measures to effectively deal with the effects of the disaster. Now you'll recall, um, Mr. so ago, I said, the, this research zeroes in on that particular um, measure that requires water um, as a measure to minimize the spread of COVID-19. So in essence, this um, regulation called upon all the, the, the departments to put in place, including Municipality, local municipalities to put in place measures that ensure minimizing um, the, to ensure the minimization of the spread of COVID-19. Then on the 25th of March, 2020, the same department released the Disaster Management Act directions made in terms of section 27.2 by the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Now the purpose of this uh, regulations was to direct municipalities and provinces in the provision of water and sanitation services. Now, very important in these regulations because these regulations define what hot spots are in terms of the spread of COVID-19. And it defines hot spots as high risk areas for spreading the disease, considering socioeconomic vulnerabilities, such as crowded settlements, informal settlements with minimal access to services, high poverty, levels, areas with limited or no access to water and sanita sanitation services. Now, if you take a look at this definition of a hotspot, it is essentially a definition of what a South African township is, or a, def a typical definition of what most South African townships are. Now, in as much as um, these regulations uh, called for the provision of portable water services, um, to high density settlements and to provide appropriate means such as water tanks, boreholes to water constrained communities. In my next um, 
my next point will be analyzing whether or not the provision of water tanks, bowls to water constricted areas is adequate in curtailing the spread of COVID-19. Now, the third important regulation um, that was put in place um, relating to water and sanitation or the provision of water in South African townships was put in place on the 15th of April 2020 by the Department of Water and Sanitation. And these regulations are titled Water and Sanitation, sanitation Emergency Procurement COVID-19 Disaster Response Directions. Now, these regulations are in line with fulfilling the constitutional obligation of providing access to basic water supply and sanitation. Um, and this direction is given to municipalities to mitigate the impact of the pandemic by securing goods and services essential to minimizing the spread of the, pan the virus, such as water, water tankers, taps, communal taps, hand soap, sanitizers, gloves, and masks. Now, in as much as um, one may consider that this direction actually does provide for water to um, water constrained communities, these regulations are rather not explicit on the frequency of such provision of water. So it essentially means that although the Department of Water and Sanitation says in its regulations, we will provide water tanks to communities that don't have access to water. It actually doesn't say the frequency at which such water will be provided. It could be a water tank once a week. It could be a water tank three times a week. It's left to one's imagination. However, these regulations can be commended in their honest approach in addressing COVID-19 because when you analyze these regulations that um, speak to the provision of water to areas that are water scarce, they, are, they acknowledge that not everyone in South Africa actually has the access to water as aspired to in the constitution. Now, I'm going to turn my presentation to the in or adequacy of the regulations. Now, when you talk about the regulations, um, when we take them holistically, we're essentially identifying water tankers, water storage tanks, and communal boreholes as a means to help um, communities or townships that um, are water scarce. Now, in analyzing whether these are adequate or not, one would say this presents a double-edged sword. Why do I say that? Because for some, this measure, considering that these are communities that historically and traditionally go for long periods of time without access to running water, this can be perceived as a measure, as a measure to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. However, to others, this presents or heightens the risk of spread because communal water access points for residents ensure that residents spend hours seeking and queuing for water in crowds, thereby risking exposure to viruses. And if they're there in this communal taps, uh, queuing in these uh, storage tanks and water tankers, who is to say that they actually observe other measures such as physical distancing if they're going to be in those queues for a prolonged period of time. So in as much as the state has taken positive um, steps in trying to provide water access rights to those communities, such steps rather seem inadequate in the face of such an unrelenting um, enemy. Now, Professor Fombat yeah, yesterday spoke in his opening remarks and said, COVID-19 in as much as it presents us with a lot of questions and it, 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 it's challenging, not only to one uh, country challenges us as academics uh, across the globe. He said it rather present, it also presents us with an opportunity to think ahead and prepare for future pandemics. And the lessons learned so far 
from the, the regulations that have been put in place in terms of the provision of water services to townships in South Africa show sure that a more sustainable response to the pandemic must focus on water and sanitation. In COVID-19, I'd like to emphasize on, on Prof's um, um, on, on Prof's point that COVID-19 as it stands, because water access rights are a long-standing issue in South Africa, a long-standing, they're not a new issue, they're just magnified now with the challenge of COVID-19, but they present an opportunity for reflection on basic structural concerns like special inequalities in cities. And also moving forward, um, policymakers need to consider new phenomena such as urbanization and climate change in water planning policies so that a townships that suffer or that bear the brunt of urbanization and climate change are actually well prepared to confront pandemics such as COVID-19. I think in the interest of time, this is where I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, technical team, for playing for us that uh, presentation. I think now we all have a gist of what uh, Chantel Moyo uh, wanted to present yesterday, and that helps uh, for us to get a full picture of the discourse that we are having uh, right now. Um, so I can see we've got about um, 40 minutes, uh, max of 40 minutes for uh, plenary discussion. I still encourage us to send our questions. Uh, we'll really encourage that we use the chat section uh, because the fear is when we give you the microphone, some of us are not disciplined enough to make our questions short and precise. So I will give preference to those who send their questions through the uh, chat section because then it is uh, easy for us to uh, uh, pre uh, to send them to the presenters. So at this juncture, I already have the first two questions that are coming from Philip Muziri. Philip Muziri has two questions. The first one goes to Joseph Akech. And Philip asks, what has been the role of the military in enforcing the lockdown? And how has it been viewed by the ordinary citizens? The second question, which goes to Sonia Els uh, from Philip, he asks, does the seemingly easy resort to military deployment by the South African government considered a, regional, uh, considered a regional leader not tend to provide moral support and justification for less democratic countries in the continent intent on using the military for reasons beyond dealing with the pandemics? Uh, so I first give the floor to um, Joseph and then uh, I come to Sonia. Right, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please proceed. Yeah, so, so on the role of the military in, <coughs> in enforcing uh, um, measures that were adopted, I must say that South Sudan did not um, impose lockdown. I think it sort of was a semblance of a lockdown in the sense that uh, curfew was imposed at certain time and that businesses were interrupted or closed um, um, but it was not like, you know, not going out for, for individuals, movements were allowed. However, the role of the military was to enforce measures that were adopted, in particular curfew, uh, border monitoring and, and uh, closure of, uh, of, of, of movements within, uh, within the borders uh, and airports, uh, as well as at the initial stages, tracing the, the, the contacts of, of the patients. And that was decried for um, securitizing the, the, the COVID-19 by NGOs and ordinary citizens who felt that the national security in particular was uh, using a bit of force in, in identifying contacts. And this comes at the backdrop of the mistrust within the security force already, because you're talking about, are you talking about, uh, you know, are your security forces, government security forces or which, because everyone, sort of these factions have their security forces and we haven't had a unified force yet. Um, so th there was already a pre-existing suspicion and mistrust among the communities on, on the role 
um, of the of the security forces, and that sort of prevailed. But there was no analysis that was conducted to, you know, demonstrate what the communities were thinking. But I I, I could see that um, uh, the there was there was a lot of uh, discernment from from the from the public on the role of the military in enforcing COVID nineteen measures. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, please respond to us. What does uh, the move by South Africa mean for the region? Okay, from my side, um, I, I first firstly want to say that the domestic deployment of, of, of our soldiers was not unique to South Africa. Um, globally, there are numerous calls from political and military establishments to more and more use the armed forces also for internal um, security. So it's actually nothing strange. And the fact that um, we find human rights abuses um, without condoning it, definitely not condoning it, we will always have the human factor. So um, we must create the, the, the awareness for human rights um, towards soldiers, but it, it is very possible that, that the abuse will take place. And then the normally normal ordinary procedures will happen then dealing with that soldier and to be held criminally and civilly and then responsible for the action. So I would say, um, to answer Philip's question, um, yes, it might be so that um, other countries definitely in the region look at South Africa and then and decide to proceed from there. But to use the military for disaster management is nothing strange. And it's actually a good thing. Um, I'm, I personally um, see it as a positive thing to use the military um, to, to, to join hands in this force against COVID-19. Um, but yeah, it is true that, that they might look and then decide to use it for other purposes. But then, well, then, then we will take it from there, uh, sort of. So my, my answer is that um, it's definitely not strange for, for armed forces to realign and go beyond their primary purpose um, and then, then to focus on secondary tasks as well. Philip, I hope I, I've, I've answered your question. Uh, thank you, Sonia. I think if there's anything that has not been responded to, Philip will uh, raise that, but thank you for your responses. As we wait for further responses, and I will also like to inform us that uh, Chantel uh, is available to uh, uh, answer any questions, if we have any questions on her uh, recorded presentation. But as we wait for that, I just want to shoot this across the panel and uh, all of you can respond to it. Uh, my question has to do with the trust deficits. Uh, between the police and the communities generally, or, or the uh, security persons generally, um, and the lack of confidence, especially on the continent, so that uh, when communities see the police or men and women in uniform on the streets, for them it only spells nothing but trouble. Yet we've got a pandemic that we all must uh, uh, forge forces to fight, both men and women in uniform and the communities at large. So my question across the board is, how can we bridge this gap? And I want to start with Petronil. Um, no, that's such an excellent question. And I, I think that's, you know, when sort of considering how the, the state should uh, respond in a public health crisis, I think that's one of the reasons that our, our paper recommends that we should uh, take the, the decision uh, making power away from law enforcement and give it to healthcare workers because there is an underlying trust issue and once working with a healthcare worker, um, patients or members of the community seem to be more likely to then comply uh, and, you know, provide consent. Um, I can't really speak to the psychology of, you know, this this distrust with the police, uh, but there were several cases where when the police were escorting healthcare workers into communities that, you know, they were being pelted with rocks um, and then also the sense of securitization where people are concerned then when they undergo testing that, you know, they, they might be restrained and then taken into forced isolation and quarantine. Um, so I'm not sure what the remedy is, but we should definitely be alive to this trust deficit when we're trying to formulate policies 
um, where we want to co-opt the community as much as possible and avoid using forceful measures in any way, shape or form, even if it's outside of law enforcement. Uh, thank you, Patricia Neil. Uh, I hear you uh, talking about uh, the people that we should then entrust uh, with, the, with this responsibility, uh, the health workers and, and all that. Um, then to, um, to Joseph, what would be your response to that? How do we bridge the gap? Yeah, no, I think it's a very good question as well. Um, to me, I think the, the solution lies, even it, in the building of institutions because um, trust is, is, is uh, something that is earned and, and, and it's demonstrated on how the institution functions. And, and I think we have, done, we have seen across the board that um, uh, these institutions do not always follow the regulations that govern the use of force and how they function. Um, and that uh, is largely informed by the, uh, you know, how uh, the democracy is functioning in that country. Um, and, and you would see this quite uh, clearly when there is uh, an election or, or demonstration, how the police will respond. Plus also the competition for, for resources um, in, in, in the country like South Sudan, you find that it depends you know, which, which uh, institution is much closer to the center of power. And therefore that institution is, is, is trusted, is resourced. And so that triggers um, animosity, if, if, if we can say that from other institutions. And when they come in to handle um, something like this, then, then we see a fallout. As we speak, uh, the government announced uh, something different, of course, uh, but related to, to trust deficit. They announced um, in South Sudan examinement process in one county. And when the government forces went there, they unleashed uh, unprecedented use of force, killing you know, scores of civilians. And, and we saw the police standing with, with the community saying, no, no, you can't do this. So that almost triggered um, confrontation. Uh, and and I, I think it's, it's because of the way in which institutions function. And to resolve this, we would need to always strengthen institutions to ensure that um, the democratic processes of decision making appointments uh, and functioning of those institutions are monitored by the public as well, uh, whether this is a you know, through parliament or, or otherwise. I have seen in Kenya last time they had this um, police, police uh, board or something that monitors the, the way in which they function. So such institutions would need to be strengthened uh, and, and perhaps supported to ensure um, that the institutions work collaboratively uh, implementing their mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Sonia, what would be your take on that? Uh, yes, specifically with relation to the security forces, the police and uh, the military, um, I agree with Joseph that trust must be earned. But unfortunately, the, the, the distrust between the members of the security force and, and the citizens um, must be seen against the backdrop of the history of South Africa, where um, especially during the apartheid era, the, the, the soldiers and the policemen were the ones enforcing the curfews. Um, during those states of emergencies. So I think in future, um, we, we still have a lot to do to, to reinstate that, that, that trust between the security services members and, and uh, the civilians. Um, unfortunately, that will only become better if the, the conduct of the policemen and the conduct of the soldiers in future, and while now currently during the enforcement of the lockdown, display a different way of doing, um, a more, more of Ubuntu, more of assisting the, the people rather than enforcing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is a way of education and a way of displaying um, uh, trust, um, to, to install the trust again. That's, that's my take. Thank you, uh, Sonia. I have a question pro from Professor Fombad, which is directed to Petronil. And he would like to, uh, he says that one of your suggestions is that we should remove criminal penalties. And then he asks, how then do we deal with the uh, problem of non-compliance with uh, for non compliance for example, uh, something as simple as wearing the mask? Do you think there is an issue of information deficit? Um, 
let me just check yes i'm not muted uh yes i do think there is an issue with uh, information deficit so let me start off prof from that by commenting that you know before fake news um this phenomenon of conspiracy theories have actually been quite well researched especially in uh, the compliance with public health interventions and sort of ensuring that people, you know, don't become anti-vaxxers because they've heard a rumor from their neighbor about this or that. Um, and one of the, 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 the key points that have been made from this body of research is that the, the more information is given to the community and the, the history that a government has of providing accurate information tends to actually then co-op compliance. And then the, the second thing that could potentially be done instead of criminal penalties would be more community consultation. Um, and then finally, one can always opt for a, a process of civil penalties, although, you know, that's also going to have an inequitable impact so that, you know, how one goes about implementing that will, you know, probably be determined based, you know, assessing the, the specific person's income and what their abilities are to actually, you know, handle such a civil penalty. But the, the fact of the matter is that even if none of those things work, criminal penalties do not work and criminal penalties uh, don't manage to enforce compliance and the people who are affected by criminal penalties are more likely to be the poor and um, specifically the urban poor so even if none of those things work which studies have shown they you know go really far into co-opting compliance from the public uh, the fact of the matter is resorting to criminal laws um not only has no effect, but then also contributes to stigma, which then has an overflow. So even if we have no other answers, removing criminal penalties in and of itself will already have a positive effect merely by just not being present. Petra Neil, for, for your response. Um, as we wait for uh, more questions from the audience, I also have a question that I would like to ask across board. And this has to do with, um, I don't know how it is in other jurisdictions, but I know for instance, in East, East Africa, the police is always rated amongst the most corrupt uh, institutions and agencies in our society. And therefore my question is with such uh, uh, an institution uh, that is corrupt uh, ab initio, then how can they effectively be entrusted uh, to, to um, help um, contain such a, a serious crisis? Uh, because I just want to give you examples. Uh, in Kenya, for instance, we've got many people who are wearing the mask not because they think it is good for them uh, against COVID-19, but it's because they fear the arrest from the cops. Uh, there are so many people who, uh, when they are found without the mask and they have some coins in their pockets, they know they will pass or they will be able to circumvent all the restrictions, the roadblocks that have been erected on the roads. So how can we effectively fight this pandemic with uh, an agency that uh, is corrupt? Let me start this time with uh, Sonia. Well, I would say firstly to have an absolute zero, um, uh, zero approach toward, towards abusers, to, to make a, a clear stance to show that people who misabuse power or who, who are corrupt um, will definitely then be removed and be suspended. Because that was one of the problems with the, with the Corsa case as well in connection with the SNDF. Um, one of the things is that after the death of Collins Corsa, then um, the, the, the soldiers who were involved in the incident, whether they were now guilty or not, they were allowed to continue with their duties and they were not suspended. So I would say one will never get away from this corrupt thing. And in the end, you need the police to, to assist with the enforcement or the soldiers. So I think to, to show that there's, there's an aggressive thing that will happen to those who are misusing their power, or who are corrupt, that they will not be allowed to continue with their duties. That will send a clear message um, against um, corruption. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Petronil. Uh, corruption and the whole question of uh, calling our forces to accountability. How do we go about that? 
Well, I think as a point of departure, especially in, you know, these extraordinary circumstances and when dealing with disaster management, the first thing we need to do is avoid the temptation of building in a, a, an immunity clause into our regulations. So I've seen several states do this, and South Africa initially also fell into the trap, and we removed it eventually. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, just from a very practical implementation point of view is something we can do. Um, but, you know, as for the rest, that that's a basically just ensuring that there's proper anti-corruption measures um, and discipline uh, within our law enforcement agencies. Uh, I have to say, you know, um, while I understand that you want to have solidarity and have the military forces, you know, also assist in combating something like COVID, that the fact of the matter is just that the training that a police officer receives and the training that a law enforcement officer receives are very different a hybrid, sorry, I mean a military official. Um, and that has to do with, you know, how how they're trained to deal with force. Police officers obviously being used to working with civilians um, and being taught, you know, that force really is a last resort. While, you know, in a, a law of war situation where there is an acceptance that a, you're reverting to force can be fatal, uh, you know, as a, as a point of departure in dealing with another combatant, I wonder how much of you know that mentality causes a problem when we ask the military to then engage with uh, the populace and you know if they're properly trained in actually gradating their force and ensuring that they understand that you know necessity and proportionality works differently outside of war situations. Uh, yes, I'm. 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 Com I'm done, Mr. Weder. Uh, apologies, you seem to be on mute. Hi, Peter, unmute yourself. You are muted. Hello, Peter? Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry for that. Joseph, could you please respond to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that uh, the question is much wider than, than the police corruption, in my view. Uh, it's the failure of democratic governance in, in most countries. Uh, for example, in South Sudan, we've seen that the allegations of corruption flaked the high level task force that was established by the president to manage COVID-19, which received a lot of funding from external stakeholders, and that funding was, was mismanaged. Um, but in terms of the police, uh, uh, you know, corruption in this case, I think, um, again, you know, the capacity um, that they have to, you know, be accountable to themselves and to the, to the community and government is something that we have to look at, you know, in terms of regulation and the functioning of democracy, democracy in that country. Uh, and, and I think when, when, they, when they tend to mismanage resources, um, it's, it's because maybe there's an underlying problem that they are underpaid vis-a-vis um, -vis other institutions. Um, there's no proper uh, social welfare to them. And, and to me, that, that we have to see as, as you know, a democratic problem because you know, how can you have a, a huge police force or a police force that's not well resourced and yet they have you know, access to public control. And, and in this case, every human being would, would do that if they are you know, in a, in a difficult situation to survive. Um, you know, and, and I think sometimes the state actually pushes these institutions to, to behave the way they do. Um, you know, like in South Sudan, we're asking ourselves, do we need, um, you know, one million for this force? No, we don't. But if you have that and, and they are not well-funded, what are they going to do? They will stop everybody and ask for money and they will extort and, and all that. So I think it's, it's about ensuring that um, decisions about the, the numbers uh, and efficiency and training of forces um, 
you know, is, is decided through a broader process that ensures there's a budget available to effectively help them manage uh, pandemics like this, as well as other rule of law um, functions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. And just to build on to what you have mentioned uh, regarding the welfare and the safety of the, the men and women in uniform and what we expect of them. And when, when their own safety and welfare is not taken care of, I think then it means there is a disconnect between our expectations and what they're able to deliver. Uh, so my question then will be, um, to all the countries that are represented on the panel, how is their safety, the safety of the men and women in uniform when they are undertaking their duties? For instance, are they supplied with the necessary PPEs, uh, just starting with the masks, even as they do this? We've seen situations in Kenya where they'll be busy clobbering people for not wearing masks, but they themselves don't have masks. So are they well equipped? Uh, what is the experience from South Africa? And then we, we go to South Sudan between Petronil and Sonia. Sonia I'm, yeah. Sonia, I'm going to defer to you because I feel like this is more in your, your field of expertise. All right. Yes, I actually wanted to reply immediately. Um, being part of the military myself, I know for a fact that the, the PPEs, the distribution of PPEs is definitely in place. Whether the soldiers are wearing it, I cannot stand in. Um, but I know for a fact that's the one thing that is in place um, before the deployment starts, um, everyone is, is, is sensitized to, to wear the mask um, and also furnished with, with masks and other PPE. So from my perspective, I would say the problem is not with the supplying of, of the PPE, but it may be um, with the individual um, wearing the mask um, or whatever. But I think that is one, one thing in South Africa that's not a problem, according to me, in the military, apart from all the other problems. Um, not the PPE is in place, as far as I know. I, I like what you say, Sonia, that the PPE is available. Uh, and the, uh, the instances where the individual police officers or, or military people don't put them on, then when they don't do this, what 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 how are they uh, held accountable and then how is it how will they expect then the ordinary citizen to abide by some of these uh, rules and regulations when they themselves don't do that that's indeed a problem for me as well um, uh, and that's where the zero tolerance approach must come in um, mm -hmm. because currently we don't really see anything happening to those members of the security forces that's on the street without wearing the PPEs or without doing the things that they are now enforcing for the other people. So I think a clear stance must be made to, to show that those people are brought um, to be held accountable or to be suspended or not put it on the streets again or something like that, because the message must be clear and loud that the, the SINDF or the police is not accommodating um, those uh, uh, transgressions by their members. Okay, I lost you, Sonia, but I, I think I got the gist of your response that uh, the, the rules should apply across board because this pandemic is not a respect of persons. It doesn't know a person in uniform or not. We think we all have to play by the rules. I have a question here that is from uh, Bandandit, and it goes to Petronil. And she says that in South Africa, our biggest issue in the health sector is the issue of accessibility and availability, especially in the public hospitals. And we have seen that countries like Spain hospitals have been nationalized. Will this be an effective strategy in response to the pandemics in the pandemic in South Africa so that we see uh, a merger between private and public hospitals? Uh, Peter, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Sephora Abdul Karim. Sephora? Right. Yeah, um, that is good. Good morning, everyone. Um, in the chat, I had, had briefly uh, responded to this question. Um, you know, it, it, um, although um, NHI could have could have contributed, um, the government did take some steps fairly fairly early on to try and um, harmonise activities across 
private and public and to also make private facilities available to the public sector through things like the creation of a block exemption that would allow um, public hospitals and pub the public sector to contract with private healthcare facilities. Um, so it could have made a difference to, for example, scaling up testing at the time that the NHLS had a backlog. But um, when we saw, like, for example, the surge, and this has been the case in most countries, um, the capacity was taken up in both private and public healthcare services. So in terms of preventative services, it probably could have made a substantial difference. But in terms of overall healthcare provision, um, it, it's not clear that it would have made all that much more difference. Thank you, uh, Safura, I guess. Yes, thank you, Safura, for your response. Um, do we have any other question from the audience? Any other question from the audience as we wind down? Technical team, anything from the audience? Then perhaps lastly from me is, uh, again, uh, going to all the panelists. Uh, the use of the military and, and, and the, the police agency or the law enforcement agency in um, containing this pandemic. And if we look at that in the history of many of the African countries where the law enforcement agencies have been used for partisan interests and where there is no regulation and where these people are not held accountable, what does this mean? Uh, moving forward in so far as the uh, uh, promotion and protection of human rights and rule of law on the continent uh, is concerned. Let me start with Akech. Um, sorry, I, 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 can, you, can you paraphrase the, the question? Sorry. All right. My, my, my question is just, uh, we have seen in many instances where the uh, law enforcement agencies on the continent have been used to advance the interests of, especially the elites, the, the, the ruling parties and, and the, the politicians. So they tend to take bipartisan, I mean, partisan uh, um, uh, roles when they're enforcing some of these things. And now we are using them to contain uh, this pandemic using whatever legal framework that is in place. What danger does this pose for the advancement and promotion of human rights and rule of law generally on the continent? You can give us an example from South Sudan, if it is left unchecked. No, I, I think it's a very good question. It, it, it seems to me that the, uh, the impact is clear, that you're building a, you know, a partisan army uh, that is going to be challenged by those that are excluded from, from, from the beginning. And, and the case in point, if you were to look at South Sudan, where different factions have been fighting for state control, it's such that when you bring these forces together, they still have allegiance to their political factions uh, much more than, than the state. Uh, and when they are deployed, they tend to function that way, including even receiving orders. Um, and, and I think the underlying factor is also the extent to which the forces um, have understanding of, of what is at stake, you know, uh, having one country and national integrity, as well as understanding that um, the use of force um, is, is supposed to be guided by a constitution. Uh, and, and, and I would again go back to the idea of, you know, ensuring that institutions are built on the basis of, you know, uh, national values. In our case, we would like to, you know, start from there by rebuilding this nation using those values to look at each institution and say, you know, if you are to be a soldier, these are the basic requirements uh, for, for you to fit in there. And that's why our peace agreement outlines the mechanisms for rebuilding the, the security sector as well as other institutions. So when institutions are built, uh, we, we, we see that um, there are limitations that will prevent uh, some of these individuals from acting contrary to what the law requires as well as that of the uh, democratic ideals. Um, but where there is a conflict, you, you are going to see that division because um, uh, you know, one will have to protect their ethnic groups. Um, and, and so if you send me to a community um, to, to impose uh, you know, orders that are, that are granted by the state and, and I have a grudge with that community, I'm going to act like that. Um, especially if you are a new country like South Sudan, 
where capacities um, are yet to be built within the security sector. So I think it, it's really building a democratic system that, that allows for transparency as well as getting people with records um, of understanding you know, what is at stake into those institutions and um, you know, removing those that are not fit to be in those institutions. Thank you, Joseph. Let me go to Sonia. Thank you. I think the South African perspective, um, the legal mechanisms are definitely in place. The Constitution um, and, and the Defence Act, um, it, it is clear that nobody is above the law in South Africa. But in the end, it's a matter of, of training and a matter of awareness. Um, if if the, the soldiers are not properly trained, then uh, it, it's useless to have this dynamic constitution. So in the end, I think it, it's a matter of back to the drawing board, um, uh, vigorously train soldiers before they are using um, for other purposes than, than, than um, armed forces um, going out to, conducting war or something like that. So in the end, um, I, I doubt whether the problem in South Africa is definitely not lying with the legal mechanisms, mm -hmm. but in, in the execution of the, of, of the duties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Petronil and uh, Safura, anything you want to add on to that? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think Dr. Als is 100% correct. I, you know, the problem there doesn't seem to lie with the, the legal instruments. You know, we've sort of had to, as a, a nation, face uh, this issue of um, overly excessive force being used, especially by the police when we had the Maracana incident um, a few years ago where, you know, there was a protest and a, uh, a group of miners were fatally shot by the police. And, you know, there was a lot of investigation and a lot of reflection done locally. And, you know, one of the big issues that uh, came out of that whole saga was that the police officers entrusted with actually enforcing uh, you know, pop policing, what we call it, just they were not adequately trained and they were not adequately, um, you know, given gear and uh, capacitated. And, you know, one of the theories from that incident was that some of the shooting actually occurred because the police erroneously uh, thought they were, sh uh, miners were shooting at them and the police were actually shooting at each other. And it, you know, um, ended up being such a big disaster. And that's just something that, that can only be fixed within the institutions. Um, and then just maybe if I can make a comment here, it, it has to be top down. We've seen, you know, sort of high profile incidents of members of government and, you know, generals um, breaching the lockdown rules. You know, we had a, an incident where tobacco has now been banned for uh, three, four months. And we saw at a, a state funeral that, you know, there were members of the military smoking and, you know, sort of a, a joke, like when did they, you know, did they buy that four or five months ago? And, you know, the obvious answer to that is no. And we had a minister, um, you know, within the first three weeks of lockdown, going to a friend and having a bit of a party and putting it on Facebook. And I, I just don't know if we can expect this discipline from our law enforcement, if we do not see it in government. Um, where people are then remunerated um, to a much better degree. Thank you very much, Petronil, for that. Uh, Safura, do you have anything you want to add? I think the other speakers have captured everything perfectly. All right. Thank you so very much. And ladies and gentlemen, it is at this juncture that uh, I wish to bring this session to a close. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, uh, very much for such a wonderful session that we've had this morning. Dr. Sonia Els, uh, Joseph Akech, Petronil Kruger, and Safura Karim, as well as Chantel Moyo, who went an extra mile to just make sure that uh, her presentation is not left out. Uh, uh, the uh, challenges uh, that she, she, she is facing with the internet connection notwithstanding. So at this juncture, allow me then to take, uh, uh, to hand it over back to Professor Fombad for uh, closing uh, remarks and uh, announcement on the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, let me join you to thank the presenters. It's been really very interesting. I've, I think I've learned an awful lot in the presentations and in the discussion that followed. 
Um, it's just left for me to also say, okay, um, the second session will start at 2 p.m. precisely, but let's try to get in by 10 minutes to two so that um, we get ready and prepared for this final session. So I look forward to seeing all of you because it's a very important session and there are many very interesting papers that are going to be presented during it. So thank you again, Peter. Thank everybody for participating. Uh, enjoy a lunch or tea break and let's meet again shortly. <laughs>